So my first question uh, for all of the panelists uh, is, do you agree that the data is a key question? Um, and I'm going to follow that up with uh, the question of, well, what will help us advance uh, getting actionable data? But let's start with, do you agree with Michael's perspective on it's the data that will get us over the hurdles? Yeah, so it, it wasn't about the data per se. It's about having enough information on why people make the decisions they do, the behavioral analysis of uh, energy. And it's those types of, that type of energy data set. Um, and I mean, I mean you, can, you can take a look at the terabytes of data that you get in from green buildings. Um, and, it's, and as far as an investment risk analysis, it's meaningless unless you can add context to it. And as the context, why people do what they do, what programs work, which ones don't work, um, which investments have the highest yield, which ones don't. It's that type of analysis that isn't being done across the board. So it's not just about data, it's about how they use that data. Does that make sense? Good clarification. Yes. Comments? Yeah. Yeah. I, I would just add to that that it, it also depends on what data you're talking about. It's, it's one thing to recognize energy savings. It's, it's slightly different than although hopefully related for that to actually result in cash flow and for that cash flow then be applied to actual repayment of loans, which is my primary concern, right? If we extend the, the loan and the energy efficiency upgrade is made, it's fantastic from a sort of social perspective if those energy efficiency gains are realized, but it's not good from the lender's perspective if those savings are either you know overrun by other costs in another part of the building or for whatever reason not actually applied to repay the loan. That, when I talk about data, that's what I'm specifically looking for is actual loan performance data. Does that in fact correspond to you know, the other more sort of real world energy savings data? Okay, that's very helpful because I think uh, what, what you were saying, uh, Baxter, in your presentation was there's a need for gathering uh, the experience of mortgage lending, carrying it through, especially through third parties, uh, such as cities, uh, municipalities, uh, who are indeed putting these uh, investment programs together. Uh, do others have uh, perspectives on this? I, I just, from, a, from an appraisal perspective, um, I have a tough time just getting the fundamental information a lot of times. And one piece of advice I give uh, an owner of a lead building or somebody with uh, a solar PV is just start a file, just get a three ring binder and just put things in there that relate to this. I mean, it's like pulling teeth and this is very fundamental stuff. So on a, on a high level, getting really strong market data and, and performance, but I mean, on the ground, just getting owners of high performance buildings to really record what's going on, like a year's worth of utility bills, I still have to beg for that. So that's really, it's kind of, a, it's surprising, but it's real. Actually, I would like to follow up on that specifically. This, that follows up something you said earlier, which I think was you, which made me surprised, that actually you should keep those records, uh, I'm told I think I need to move back here for being picked up, uh, that you should keep those records of the investments and how much it costs, so that will affect the value at the end of the day. And we use the word reversion. Um, of course, you know, from a real estate investment perspective, we will look at the value of the building and not just the cash flows at the end of the day. But your point that we should actually keep the investment information um, I'm, I'm not well, quite I, getting it. The, the cost approach is one of the three basic Got approaches it. to appraisal. Okay. So, so yeah, when you're looking at buying a car, you know, if the car costs thirty thousand dollars new, you know, you're going to start sort of from there. And there's a lot of great behavioral economics papers written about anchoring and cost. You know, if you give someone a number, they'll immediately start thinking that's the value. So that usually with the appraisal process happens when something is new. So logically, if you put fifty thousand dollars into a building and the next day you tried to sell the building and the buyer of the building came up and said, Well, you know, you just spent fifty thousand dollars, well, okay, then that's gonna affect him. And and so that would and th that's gonna be the same in the future as well. I mean two identical buildings, one has been upgraded with all new windows, cost somebody fifty thousand bucks, let's say, 
the next door building, that hasn't been done. Without knowing anything about the energy savings, you know that building is a better building. And so that will be an effect. And then again, you've got the income approach, which is a lot of what we've been talking about, the cash flow and looking at the impact of that. These are just parallel tracks to getting the market value and they mimic what, behave, what, what buyers and sellers do all the time. They use all this stuff and then they sort of pull a number out of their head, which seems credible. Scott, I, I, I know you have a comment that you'd like to make, but I also would like you to follow up on James's point. To what degree are appraisers, and perhaps went a little bit back and forth, back to you, James, to what extent are appraisers using information like investment through the construction cluster or other um, of the three methodologies to give credit for energy efficient investments? But I don't want to stop you, Scott, from going to what you want to say first. Data is a big and long topic, but let me just deal with the appraisal. An actual appraiser like James, who does a full narrative appraisal after the fact on a permanent building, is maybe 5 or 10% of what the, the value related issue of making a decision is. All, the data that you need is for the people that are making the decision based on the forecast. So appraisals are not that important. I call it value, it's not, it's value beyond formal reports. So that's one thing. Let me do two, couple things on data. All the ordinances, the new one in Philadelphia, Ordinance 84 in New York, most of the disclosure databases are not that critical to the decision making. They're motivational tools to motivate either tenants or owners to do something. At that point, you need a different kind of data, more detailed than would typically disclose. So disclosure is, doesn't help underwriting, it helps motivate, that's an important one. And then second of all, um, I call it the 90, you spend 90% of your time trying to perfect energy data when it only creates 10% of the value. If you think about what a retrofit decision is or a sustainability investment decision, you're gonna do a forecast, and I'm on investment committee, I get a forecast to pro forma, and then I spend hours determining whether each of the different variables are correct. And the things about risk, was there commissioning done, best practices, contracts, service providers, integrated design. There's a whole bunch of process things. Did they do best practices relative to the features? Reducing the risk is not a soft value. Value equals cash flow divided by discount rate or risk. Risk is a hard value. So we need a lot more data and in a form that's not always statistical or number or quantifiable because that when people ask me, well, what do data, what do you need, what kind of data do you need? I always ask, well, I don't know, what kind of analytic model would you use? I know how investors, and I know how underwriters, when they do their package, I know the information that they need. 90% of it is textual and contextual and assessing the comparables and, and doing it. So I would just say that data may be different. In fact, it's very different than what a lot of people think it is. A lot of money and time is spent on data that's only so let, let's actually pursue that question of, of data for a moment. There was, in the earlier on presentations, discussions of uh, potential for standardized data, uh, including uh, standardized data through um, uh, in, in, in the paper that we looked at earlier uh, that, Michael, you were talking about in property condition. I'm sorry, actually, Matt, you were talking about in the property condition report. Is there room? for standardizing data in property condition reports or other ways of capturing standardized data about building efficiency, other than, of course, the Energy Star, which is a relative? Well, I think in the, in the earlier presentation, it was talking specifically about office, which I, I just want to get back to this idea of the seven tribes of real estate, which I think is one of the most crucial points that we could deliver here in terms of the necessity for data and standardization. To standardize a property condition uh, uh, assessment report for all different property types wouldn't necessarily make sense and also would mean something very different in each case for energy efficiency. So I think there is room in the office world for something like that. Um, it might be better to move from the USTBC standards than from the PCA, but I'm sure some of the actual appraisers here might Wait a different. second, Matt, before you go for it, what do you mean by those? for others, USGBC. Oh, I'm sororry. So LEED has different um, systems for rating buildings, as I'm sure everyone knows. 
those systems uh, and those ratings don't necessarily correlate directly to energy efficiency. They definitely correlate to something, and we could make, there are a lot of studies that have been shown, that have been done, that show some of the other factors that were put up there besides just cost savings. But when we talk about energy efficiency, um, there's no direct link between any rating or system or report that we have to talk about the energy efficiency of a building. And I think if you were to try to make such a link, it would have to be property type specific sure. in addition to taking into account uh, geographic. So location. do others see value in property type specific energy efficient standards or data reporting? Absolutely, there is an ASTM standard that has been developed. There is 170 people on the advisory board that talks about the reporting of it. Let me just talk about the property condition assessment report. If I want to know, the, the key thing about energy is the risk about how the retrofit's going to work and what energy savings will be. A property condition assessment is on a property that already has the energy use from the retrofit in real time. Why do I need to understand all the energy features, which is sort of prescriptive? Did they have good windows? Did they have did this one? I know the actual energies. I can actually look at it and underwrite it. Its effect on NOI is there. So, what, How do you know the actual energy? By Because we're talking about an existing property. So you know the history of the property. Property condition assessments are done on properties that exist. To look at in the primary. So you have the utility bills. Is that what you're referring to? I have the utility bills. How, yeah. Okay. It's the, the question I would just have is the data exists, but how would you acquire that as a third party, you know, attempting to purchase a building? I know that we can't necessarily get at You can ask for them and they give them to you or you don't, but the utility won't provide that in most jurisdictions. In every case with an investment grade property, you will definitely have line items for energy and you compare it to energy use in other buildings of the type and you have your, in fact, there is a case to be made that if somebody's operating their building better than market, that what an appraiser actually needs to do is market back to the market, which is an interesting concept. All I'm saying is that the property condition I, I, assessment report is not, the, yeah, I'll tell you it's good for research, because if you have a PCA and you have the detail, after the fact, you can go and try to assess which features and strategies produce the most energy efficiency. So it's really good for researchers but it's not necessarily important relative to the regimen. Well, so I'm going, to, I'm going to challenge you a little bit on that for the sake of the discussion. Uh, good for researchers, you know, writing research papers. That's maybe enough for me since I'm a researcher. But, but it's, it's, it seems to me that if you actually could correlate the property condition report, the actual features that are affecting energy efficiency to the energy costs, from the utility bill, that this would be of use not only for researchers, but for example, would be of use to appraisers and to lenders who are considering underwriting investment. No? Yes, it's part of the database on um, on whole bill. Yeah, I mean, it, it's good in the long run, but it's not necessarily an underwriting. Building not, by building. Not a building by building thing. It's something that will build, build over time. And that's what I think the Department of Energy has a big database of, of actual post occupancy, and that's the intent of that. And a lot of that actually, I won't go into more of it if anybody else has some comments. Uh, with the, you know, this, this day today is about how to move the market for retrofit. So, in a sense, you've got a building which operates today, which is the property condition assessment report, which is the ASTM standard, okay? And they're the guys who did the phase one, too. Okay, they've also got the standard, the Building Energy Performance Assessments, or BEPA. And that's a standardized data set of specific line item cell descriptions for identifying energy use, adjusted for climate, for use. Uh, and this is being applied right now in the state of Connecticut with a program called C-PACE, which is Connecticut PACE. And, and it's, it's, for me, uh, one of the best applications of the data set, this BEPA data set, which I believe is, could be could grow into a standard like the phase one. I mean, PCA is a brand. It's not just some report. This is a specific document. And the phase one is a specific document. And so BIPA could develop into that data standard. And that would be the way that you would take a building that's today, project energy savings through a remodel budget, through BIPA, to model that those improvements 
through. There's lots of software. The Department of Energy's got 200 of them listed. There's some standards that, that are very used all the time for modeling the renovation budget, and then you can project the energy savings. And I see those when I see a proposed lead project that has an energy savings of, let's say, 30%. So when I look at that, what I do, I just, <laughs> it's a little sloppy, but I say, I'll give you half. So if they say in the projection and the model that, that the statistical estimate of 30% energy savings, I say, I'll give you 15% of that. So I'll give you savings that represent about half of that gain. Come back in three years, when you've got the 30%, can show me that it's operating better than the market where you are, and I'll give you the rest. So it's those stages. It's that getting the baseline set up, projecting the model, we're using standards like BIPA, and then coming to a guy like me and saying, I've got a proposed upgrade. This is what I think I'm going to save, and I'll give him half. James, this is a follow-up question then, Scott. Uh, when you say, I'll give you half, give you guys again. just just for, for my second press, your audience, I'll give you half. What you mean by that is uh, the, the investment is proposed to raise the value of the building by 30000 or 300000 let's say, and by you're giving half, or the investment oh, is 300000 You mean well, that you'll, give, you'll yeah. raise the value of the building by 150000 Well, it's, it's, it's even, it's, it's very simple. There's a cash flow, I've got income, I've got vacancy, I've got expenses in the, in the expenses, there's utilities. They're telling me I've got a report right here that says I'm going to save 30% on my utilities. I say, okay, that one line right there, instead of, you know, X, you know, you say the market, let's say, is $10,000 a month, okay, and you say, you know, it's going to be, you know, you'll be at $7,000 a month. I'll do it, you know, at half of that. So that's just right. a perfect example. He's taking a 50% haircut on the complete value of energy efficiency just because it's too risky. I would ask the question, is there information that could be argued to convince him that that it should be less than a 50% discount. I would contend that there's lots. And that kind of qualitative argument information, we did commissioning, we did this, we did that, we had the best architects, we did this and we did that, that that is really valuable, hard value information and that it's a different kind of information that's collected today. I hear what you're saying like the best about- practices, That's what underwriting does, it's more of, you're, you underwrite the credit, the borrower, all these things that are not just the energy. So those are qualitative pieces of information, which one-on-one, -on -one, but can you standardize for that for broad mortgage underwriting? And I'm going to turn to other people around all the right. table. I got, I got one thing. Okay, I mentioned this program in Connecticut, CPACE. Part of what they're offering is insurance. Hanover Re is a reinsurance company, and they are through a company called Energy, energy with an I, they are offering insurance. So if you come, to, if, if they came to me and they said, I've got this great, two guys come to me, one without insurance, one with insurance, they said, so wait a minute, you have a company that you've actually paid a policy to cover to guarantee these energy savings? You got it. Cost 2% and I would 2%. read, and I would read the, uh, you know, like any insurance policy, you better read the fine. But it's fully financed. It's 100% it, 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 finance in the deal. So instead of it maybe paying back in five years, it pays back in five and a half. You've got zero down. What's the return, return on that? Infinity, I think. So that's a, a kind of a third party role. Do you, folks, anybody else want to guarantee, uh, want to I, speak I, about I think, other third party? You know, yes, go ahead. There's a couple different discussions I think going on here, but the, that helps, I think, with the customer adoption mm -hmm. to some level. It, it's still, though, uh, from sitting in my seat, there's still the challenge of it. Let's just take a theoretical example. If I'm gonna make energy efficiency loans to 100,000 residential homeowners in New England through various different utilities, you know, even if the energy efficiency is recognized, and they are saying their bills go from $100, I'm just picking up right there, from round numbers, $100 a month to $70 a month, that's great, and that person theoretically has an extra $30 in their pocket, maybe with the cost of financing, even if it's on bill, they're paying 85 instead of 100. That doesn't protect, so this is what I'm getting at, that savings doesn't protect you from all the other volatility around consumer credit. It doesn't protect me if that person loses his or her job. It doesn't protect me if the person's house burns down, necessarily. There's just a lot of other things that come into play with respect to whether I get repaid. 
and energy efficiency is just a smaller component. I think, Matt, what you were talking, and Scott, your response, you touched on this a bit, which is, yes, you know, maybe energy efficiency is a component of the analysis around mortgages, but it's such a massively complex matrix of different things that drive value of a building. Even if energy efficiency is meaningful and recognized, it doesn't really affect repayment on indebtedness associated with that building. And, and that's the concern that I think, you know, for some period of time, if, you're, if we're going to start leaning into this market, there has to be a, a lot of performance data, not just that the energy efficiency is recognized, but that, it, that energy efficiency recognition drives better repayment. And that's, that's what keep it. From a lender's perspective, it frankly doesn't matter whether the person, whether the energy efficiency is realized or not, so long as the person is paying, repaying the loan. And that's, that's important. Now, there are ways, I think, that, and this is why I think we've had more success in sort of the industrial sector. If you're dealing with a larger entity, you can, you've got a little bit more flexibility to get into structural solutions for how to capture that value that's recognized through energy savings. To, to build a you know, really complex structured deal and try to sell that to 100,000 consumers in New England, very hard to do. If you're dealing with one entity, one company that says, I'm going to save not $30 on my energy bill, but $30 million, or some massive amount, they said, that's worth it, and I'm willing to spend three months with the structured credit union approach and I to figure out how we capture the savings and it drives repayment actually. So, I just want to jump on that because uh, I do work with industrial customers locating plants. And one of the things that I put at the end of the presentation there uh, for my comments was that it's actually uh, difficult to get exact energy cost information for some of these large industrial users um, for different localities where they could locate. And oftentimes it could be up to 40 or 50% of their total cost of a 20 year plan. So they are very, very interested in these 10, 15 percent in a way that uh, a, an office user would not be. And uh, disclosure around that and structuring around that, you're talking about 200, 300 million dollar deals at a time, where uh, right now I can tell you from firsthand experience, people that are seeking to be more energy efficient, just reputationally, and also would save a ton of money, do not have the data to make that decision. Now, hold on, hold on. So back to you. Your decision making would that matter to you if there is a history of such data? In terms of the, the savings? In, in terms of you're making the loan, the case is brought to you that there will be thirty million dollar savings. Yes. Well, but if you have some backup from previous similar investments, does that matter to you? Yes. And let me in this context where it's a single building, you're dealing with one entity, you can say, all right, this is there are only so many factors that are driving the cash flows at that one. Borrowers. So, but in any case, you look at history of similar borrowers, similar investors. Yes, because that gives you the confidence that okay, and they install agree? a new boiler and. And do you agree new. with Matt's point, which is that the data are not out there, and it would be useful to have the data out there? Uh, I actually, I think, I'm probably more in Michael's camp. I think the, the the data is there for certain types of energy efficiency upgrades. You can say if you replace a boiler and all the windows and insulate all your pipes. You know, whether you haircut it 50 percent or 25, to your point, it may not be perfectly known, but it's not zero, and we will give some credit for that. But it's it's very situationally specific, and I think that what we're at least part of what this discussion is about is how do you get this beyond just going building by building, and and get some confidence to do this on a much more distributed basis. Exactly. I don't think that's entirely just about. Confidence in energy efficiency is about confidence in loan repayment generally, which is just about one of the worst times you could be asking the question about whether people are going to repay their loans. Yeah, and I, I think that's a fair point, Baxter, but I think there's also the other point which you are said before that, which is the situational complexity makes the gathering of the data not, it's not going to be standardized automatically. Right. And how do we get around that issue? But Michael, go ahead. Well, that's exactly the point. So you started off this question by saying on the standardization of data from data standards. Yes. And then how valuable is that data? Data is only valuable if it has context, right? So when I was saying the Bank of Montreal all offers points off the of mortgage based on energy efficiency, they've done the calculation. Now whether it's a good calculation or not, by the way, right? 
but they may to be overpricing the mortgages to begin with. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly, it may just be market. But uh, you can make those determinations if you have an outdated. And so, by the way, is that consumer uh, housing homeowners? Uh, homeowners home are really not, right? So, so you is this score also commercial? Does Bank of Montreal? Uh, no, I don't know. I think it is only homeowners. Hold but, on, I think it's home. Yeah, but the idea is the <clears> same. <throat> is that if you have enough data on, like you're saying, past performance of loan repayment plus energy efficiency plus all these other things, you can start making risk determinations on investment. Furthermore, it doesn't have to be uh, underwriting loan, right? You can be looking at alternative investment vehicles for ESCOs, right? So an ESCO, they go in, they say, I'll save you $100 million of energy this year, don't pay me a dime now, you can pay me 30% be once I realize the savings. They can't do retrofits a lot of time because they can't afford to do it because the house is going to cost them too much money up front. So what they would like to do is take a loan, have that underwritten, and then repay the loan at the end of the deal. Now that's a data set that you probably could get your arms around, right? Because as long as those retrofits do save money, they will get paid and then repay back the loan. So there's fewer data, data points, but it's a different type of business. So Michael, I think that's a really important point. We don't have anybody at this table up front, maybe someone in the audience, who represents ESCOs, but I would nonetheless ask the people at the panel, uh, are ESCOs and the financing of ESCOs a vehicle for, for recognizing the greater efficiency in the data? Are there, or even the current state, No. Let me explain why. Let me just talk with a second about the data issue. Big differences between residential and commercial, a lot of residential stuff there. Um, I, I don't believe that, that, and I've looked at all, I've done a tremendous amount of work on default probability forecasting and so forth, and I just don't think we're going to get to the point where we have enough data on particular features on the building, because we're never going to have that at enough detail. We're, at, we're going to get to a point where we can do it. However, the way that, if you get a securitization, you get enough mortgages, and so on, maybe this, this is the way that you actually price a loan if you're in the rating agencies. They do a, a pro forma on, on all the loans and all their cash flow, and they do debt service coverage ratios. And then they have a thing off to the right where they make adjustments for like environmental, all things that are a little more difficult. And that's where a lot of this energy risk stuff in the paper this morning would apply on this. And that's where diversification comes in, right? Because you want a portfolio. And so when you start to put loans in and out of a portfolio, and this is what you do if you're a warehouser, is that you can actually price it at that level. And I think that you could get statistics that would be good enough to help in the pricing at a securitization level. I think that the particularities, that the way that you would approach it, even if you had more statistically based data, when you got to a, a property, it would be so specific that, again, it would be a hypothesis, but it would not be as helpful as just doing a plug in. So I have, uh, go ahead, Matt. Back. Sorry, I just want to make one important clarification. I think it was your point, but you followed up on it, Scott, that that's a, the key distinction here is to distinguish between mortgages and energy efficiency loans per se. What, what I have been talking about are not mortgages. And I think, you know, for someone like BMO to say, I'll have a quarter of a point on your loan if you put in $20,000 worth of, of energy efficiency upgrades. Well, it, that's probably a part because BMO doesn't probably think that they were right or wrong on their underwriting by a quarter of a point. <laughs> it's not whether they recover the value on that house is not that thin a margin. And if they're putting positive CapEx upgrades into the house, probably all the better, but they weren't off by that much to begin anyhow. The type of loans that I'm talking about are not mortgages. These are coming in after the fact, where you're totally, you're, you're behind the mortgage, you're not secured by the property, you're purely relying on, is the person going to repay, repay you? Is the, is the company going to repay you? Is the, you know, resident, is the multifamily homeowner going to repay you? Is the homeowner, depending on sort of where you are in the spectrum. That's a very different analysis. I think a lot of what we've been focusing on the discussion has been around mortgages per se. I think that it, it is relevant to mortgages, but that kind of gets to your point about timing of 
when is the financing made? So you're doing your energy efficiency upgrade at the same time that you're refinancing your whole mortgage. Yes, I think they can drive the discussion differently, but if you're talking about pure energy efficiency loans, it's a different discussion, it's a different suite of, of factors that, are, that you have to think about and analyze. Well, let me take that, that on, for, follow, just take it on directly and then to Michael. My assumption has been in this conversation that a mortgage use for energy efficient investment is the most, the cheapest way of going for financing. But what for I'm sure. here, but for sure. So why, why would you even be talking about loans that were not backed by mortgages? Because sometimes it's done after the fact. If you already have a mortgage on your house, but you want to go put in a boiler upgrade and, and everything else, you, I mean, certainly there are plenty of utilities that are going out and offering uh, incentives to do that. There are very small pilot programs where they're offering low interest, non-secure loans to do energy efficiency upgrades with the hope and expectation that the savings generated will be used to, to pay those, repay those loans. But you could get a construction loan. You could get a second mortgage in a sense. No? Or, or people, I'd like a reaction to that. It, it would be, it, Scott? Not always, I don't think, but maybe. It would be more like an equipment loan. In an equipment it's loan today, it's, a, it's done on a, on a, you know, it's a uniform commercial thing, not a mortgage. And, so it uh, wouldn't be a mortgage? Yeah. It's, it's in, for equipment loans, for all the loans that have been done, on average, when there's a default, you have about a 10 to 15 percent ability to recapture value from the collateral. So it's just, it's not a very secure vehicle. That, there's some security there, but it's not a mortgage. It's a UCC. Um, while we have all the experts on the panel, can we give a sense of scale of how many energy efficiency loans um, we think there have been compared to sort of mortgages on houses, like pure energy efficiency, not combined with anything else? I, I, I haven't found a lender that's done one. I've asked as well as, as well as far as ever done an energy efficiency retrofit loan on yeah, if the question is, not has, not has not anyone not. ever done one? It's yeah, different sure. than as well as far as ever doing. And I think that it's true that this conversation has been around mortgages and banking as banks providing the financing for these energy retrofits. And I, I got to tell you, I don't think it's going to happen through banks. I think that it's going to happen through these hybrid uh, products like PACE or in California right now there's some research going on for on-bill financing. PACE is property assessed clean energy. Just set, show of hands. Who knows what PACE is? Okay, it's property assessed clean energy. You get a loan. It's repaid through your property taxes. It stays with the building. Big, big deal. Also lots of times it's zero down. In California and historically there's been, these things have been around a while, there's also utility on-bill financing which is where the loan stays with the meter. Now, both of these PACE loans and these utility on-bill loans are targeted to securitization. And that's why home mortgages are so cheap, because they can bundle them, they can sell, they can resell them. There used to be a robust market in the commercial mortgage-backed security. That's all kind of gone away a little bit. But, you know, people are still hoping that's coming back. Well, if you can standardize the loans into a mortgage, you know, a security you could sell, you're going to get the cheapest capital. And, I, and personally, I think that it could easily be one of these hybrid versions where there's a public-private partnership, that, that these PACE loans or on-bill utility loans that stay with the property, that have the chance to be repaid through time, are going to be secured and bundled in some way that they're credit enhanced, or I mentioned, you know, reports in there. So I, I, I wouldn't say that the solution is going to necessarily come from banks, at least right now. You're going to see private money come in first. Even a base requires a bank. You have a construction loan up front, banks get involved, and then once it's not a big heavy risk, it becomes like a muni bond and you go securitize. But you can't you cannot securitize a construction loan. They tried it with CDOs in two thousand six, that was the end of the I industry. Was that. Yeah. <laughs> so I just wanna I set Baxter up a little bit. I'm I'm working on a trying to do something similar to this right now in the southeast to do a securitization payback by either um, taxes or uh, some other effect on a municipality-wide area because the energy efficiency loans as such individually are usually so small and don't, as you're hearing, haven't really happened. So I know that you have some experience with this. I'm curious. So I agree that a very small number of 
pure energy efficiency loans that they ended up in a few pilot projects. I think it was, I think it was in Illinois or Ohio. There was one utility that literally did like five or ten million dollars worth, and otherwise, it's, you know, that's the only project that I'm aware of. But not banks, I, private lenders, maybe, or yeah, somebody else. But. It, uh, it was a it was a community bank partnered with a utility, as I as I understand the program. I don't know it is. But I, I think if there's a role for more banks to play, um, I agree. I don't, well, at this particular moment in time, I think, you know, unlikely that municipalities are in a great position to fund these off their own balance sheet. I don't think banks, frankly, are in a great position to fund them off their own balance sheet. But the, the role that banks can play is to, you know, work with all the, the relevant stakeholders and connect them to the capital markets generally. Where there is a huge amount of money, that's willing to do some slightly more esoteric types of projects and to, in order to, to get yield is insurance companies and money managers all you literally trillions of dollars of money that's waiting to go to work and that's trying to find a way to achieve a premium and, and its structure of the liquidity and duration, those are all things that, that can generate that type of premium, all of which are elements that I think are going to be necessarily associated with finding an energy efficiency loan program solution. That said, as I indicated in my you know, introductory remarks, I think to try to get to a pure securitization day one is extremely hard. And I read that as next to impossible. Uh, I do think you're going to need to have this kind of bridging where in some interim period, you talk about this in the context of the SBA loans. It's a great example. I, I don't know. You know, when that program started, was the credit enhancement fifty percent or was it ninety percent? I bet it was above. I bet it was above fifty, and they've kind of like into that. And maybe another twenty years from now, it's thirty percent because you get this increasing mid twenty years too long. But some period of time, it's going to continue to go down. And I think that's where, if there are stakeholders such as the federal government, municipal governments, utilities, you know, however you want to incentivize the utilities, obviously have an incentive to sell power right up until the point where you penalize them for not achieving demand side management. So if you can get the stakeholders involved, people who are credit worthy entities, and they are able to stand up behind some of these energy efficiency loans and say, yeah, if, if these homeowners default, I'm there to cover your downside. I, that's where I think the, the path forward really is. And uh, that's not just theoretical. We're on the cusp of actually doing that deal with the utility uh, in the US. Okay, so we really want to hear about that as we go forward. I am going to um, ask for some any other comments on the panel, and I have a follow, final question. But uh, audience, uh, you, I know you, some of you have questions. I've saw, saw some hands. So maybe we'll turn to these questions, and then I'll save mine for now. Yes, please identify yourself uh, well, when you ask your question. I work for McGrath Associates. We're energy consultants and uh, energy engineers. We're not an ESCO, but we are prepared to you know, make deals with, with uh, work especially with multifamily projects and department buildings. And, and our challenge has been when we run, we've done over 100 audits of multifamily projects uh, representing over 9,000 apartments. So you know, we, we do some pretty big buildings. And when we, we look back statistically at, at our audits and what we've uh, uh, come up with and think about how do we uh, present this as a, as a market rate product to people. What is clear is that the, uh, the potential clients want this to be budget neutral. They need for uh, a loan or a financing of the project that keeps on cash flow of housing from day one through the end of, of uh, you know, the, the payback period. Um, what, what we found is that five-year loans don't do that. Ten-year loans typically do do it. You know, five-year loans get you light bulbs. You know, a ten-year loan gets you a new boiler. Uh, the kind of deep retrofit things that, that are really significant. Um, the, 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 when, when we just start playing with you know, calculators, it's not the, the rate of the loan. It doesn't matter whether it's 5% or 2% or 6%. Uh, it matters if it's 10 years instead of five years. So in terms of, of the risk that's involved, is there a way that the lenders can just say, gee, if, if I get another point or two on the rate, then I can make these, these loans available. Yeah, absolutely, that, that's one of the points that's exactly the key to why I don't think banks per se are the answer, but why the capital markets are. Banks
banks have very, all things being equal, would prefer every loan to be five years and less. Whereas insurance companies are trying to match their assets to their liabilities. And they have, especially life insurance companies, have very long liabilities. So they need long assets to match those. And so they're much more willing to go to those 10, 15, 20 year types of credits. And you're absolutely right, I've run the model myself. It doesn't matter that much. The, the rate is not what, what moves the needle, it's, it's the duration that does on the break even. Thank you. Other question? Yes, please. Just, Identify yourself. Oh, I'm sorry, there was another response. I just want to comment that um, that was part of the reason why, in Nancy's paper originally, having rate reductions is not, not the end all answer, but I'll stop there and get another question. So, please identify. Yes, my name is Marty Menkes, and uh, I'm involved in a project up in Ivy Lane, Pennsylvania. And for the last five years, I've been working on commercial and uh, residential institutional and the municipal energy retrofits. And what they want to see in my area, up in Bucks County, isn't the numbers. I mean, you can, you can just bury them in the numbers and they can turn off in three minutes. They want something they can to kick the tires up, that they can point to and say, that's what you mean. Oh, I get it. And we don't have that very much. And in but an what, effort- What would that be? Give us an example. What? What, what, what would that be? Well, we have one building that's very good in our township, and that's vertical screen. It's a federal property, and you can't get into it without, uh, you know, a lot of credit and other checks and identifications, uh, and they only take 15 people in at a time. Uh, that's the only real one that we have. Uh, the project I'm doing is a net zero project, and nobody wants to loan us any money. We're looking for a buyer for this property. It doesn't exist. The buyer that we have on tap has been having trouble for four years doing this project. We have an excellent team of people involved in it, and everybody's willing to loan us money at 10%, 7%, 8%. But we can't make an example of this, even partnering with a potential lender or angel investor. So I know this is about money in the future, but if we can't get a loan today or in this time frame, for us it won't be the future. Comments to that, Scott. Yeah. I've been a capital man in real estate industry for 30 years. First of all, sustainability or energy efficiency won't save a bad project. So, so I have all been kinds of people come to me and they say, well, gosh, I want to do this project. If it's bad real estate or if it's not fundable. So it's just, it's got to be the right real estate. Green's not going to make it happen. Second of all, construction loans are damn difficult to get, particularly if it involves land or, or ground up. And they've been impossible the last number of years. So you're basically just, it's not a green or an energy issue, it's just you're kind of caught in a mind. And I, I would probably go to a standard mortgage or an equity broker that's really good would be your best bet. Been there. Been there, done that. Okay. Yeah, hard to believe that energy is going to overcome uh, real estate. It's not just energy, there is much more to it than that in this project. It is a net zero project. There are very few of them around that you can see. That's true. Yeah, I can do Publicize it. Zero uh, architect is in the room today, and uh, we have some of the best in the business in the East Coast and maybe in the nation. They're ready to work on this. So we will we have, have we can get nine percent and ten percent interest loans to cover everything. So we will have an opportunity for some informal networking uh, shortly, and I think there's refreshments, but and hopefully there will be some uh, chance to speak about these. Um, examples of potentially good projects at that time as well. I think there was another question that I saw. Yes, please go ahead and identify yourself. I'm sorry, could you identify yourself, sir? Energy efficiency loan for a net beauty situation, you have a technology. I'm Jasper Jones. Yes, thank you. Energy efficiency loan for a net beauty situation, you have a technology that can produce more energy than will be consumed. Is that loan on the horizon? I can comment. Uh, that's, I mean, the, you're talking, it's, it could be called a feed in tariff, where you generate more electricity than you're using and you're paid for that surplus. Um, Los Angeles County just uh, instituted a, a large FIT or feed in tariff program. Germany, that's the basis of their uh, solar project. Uh, in most municipalities, I have solar power on my house. Uh, I get paid, what they do the accounting once a year, 
they reckon it out, did I use more of that year than I, I, you know, I paid for, and if I'm a surplus, they'll give me the cost of the generation, which in my case is burning coal in Utah. So all the, all the transmission lines and stuff, I'm still going to have to pay for that. So the short answer is you could make some money that way. It depends a lot on utility. Uh, it's a model that has been used in other countries. It's been very successful. It's not generally available here. There's one test program right now I know of in Los Angeles. See how it works out. Well, again, my question was, is it additional to be available to fund creation of that type of unit? That's, that's, that's a decision uh, between a, a public utility commission and a utility. It's not a bank or somebody who's going to make a loan for something like that. That's, that's, that's all regulatory. That's venture capital. So yeah. if, you're, if you're looking at the creation of a unit, right, at a smart meter, uh, that would be in the venture capital way to investment. That, uh, that, I don't think that would be sitting in the bank's side. Yeah, no, it would be for us. Uh -huh. Does that make sense? Yeah. <clears throat> well, I would like to uh, thank the panelists for, is there one more question? Did I? Yes, please go ahead. Maybe we'll have to I, start with the triple net lease I, point. I can answer the second one first, then I'll let somebody else take yeah. the first one. Uh, in, in Golden, Colorado, there's a building called the Signature Center. Wells Fargo is a construction lender. Uh, Denver has a full-service gross office market, and this developer insisted on leasing the building triple net. When they got tenants, they said, we will split the savings. We're gonna, we're gonna rent you the space for basically the standard nets Plus, you know, if you compare the two, full service gross and triple net plus the net cost, so the expenses are all being paid uh, by the tenant. After a couple years, two years, I think, we're going to look at those costs, and you're going to see that your nets are actually lower than other buildings in the area. We're going to figure out how much that is. I'll give you half. I'll keep half. So that was the answer to that. And I think the triple net model has certain advantages. Full service gross models have other advantages. The whole split incentive issue is a lot of late night conversations. It's a complicated nut. I can't crack it. So, I'm sorry. Second question. First Someone question. Wanted... You have a response also, Scott. Right, I mean, I'll just add this on triple net. The job of a landlord is to do stuff to make their tenants happy, to make them want to be in that building. If I provide them a lower triple net, lower energy costs as part of a triple net deal, it's part of a total occupancy cost analysis, typically a corporate user. So there's there's value there, there's value on the residual side on the sale, and there's value through regulatory benefits up front. So there is value. Um, and actually it's I think it's really you know, so I'm not as I think we can overcome the split incentive issue. Yeah, I agree on that. And do you want to uh, does anyone want to take the first question about the yeah, capital markets and equity? The, I mean the short answer is yes. If if there are funds that are willing to put in meaningful equity that slims down the debt check, that, that absolutely is helpful. And you know, we've been talking with, with various I mean depending upon again sort of where you are in that spectrum from industrial down to residential, there are different funds that are focusing on that. The, frankly the the issue is, I mean, depending on what papers you read, there's somewhere on the order of half a trillion dollars worth of energy efficiency upgrades that need to be made across the US, there's probably $500 million worth of funds that are allocated to specifically say residential energy efficiency upgrades. That, that itself might be an overreach in terms of the number. So you're off, you've got one basis point of equity for all of them. The change that needs to happen, it's, it's a start in the right direction, but it's there's still a massive Mismatch there. Yeah. I'll add a little bit to that too. There's, uh, if you're just looking at alternative energy vehicles or uh, alternative financing vehicles like by the way, you're going to have those are moving towards debt structures as well. So, especially when you're looking at fundraisers that are escos earlier on, because essentially you're funding a debt, uh, a full contract. Right? So, as long as they can achieve the energy efficiencies, you're investing in your ability to make good on that. So, it's, it's 
essentially a, it's essentially a dead transaction. So you're seeing a lot of that happen in private equity right now. Great. With that positive. The, 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 point, the reason we're making that point is that that's why the credit enhancements and the wraps are, are more important because there just isn't enough equity dollars out there to put a thick enough equity check in to achieve a meaningful amount of energy efficiency upgrades where the debt, the, the lenders are really going to care. They, they need to simplify, they need to get a, a, a more corporate like credit in there in, in this sort of early stage. Well, with that, is there anyone else who'd like to make some summary comments before we uh, wrap up? Are we? Yes, go ahead, Scott, please. Yeah, sure. More lawyers. I think a huge problem is getting from the construction-oriented risk up front to something that everybody I have a seasoned actual energy efficiency savings. That's really low risk, and there's tons of capital out there. Getting from there to there, and it requires lawyers and, and hard work. And um, I think that's the first time I've heard of more lawyers. <laughs> more lawyers, and also reactive as opposed to proactive being Everybody a good thing. Well, uh, let me just first of all um, thank the Hub and also uh, point to uh, all the work that the Hub is doing. And Lori Ackman, who is Deputy Director of the Hub, unfortunately was unable to make it, but she does also want to thank the EEB Hub for sponsoring this event. And this event is the beginning of what we hope will be a very important conversation, and I believe as a beginning, this has been an extraordinary, fruitful panel. Please join me in thanking the panelists.